Good and the Academy, what have we learned? Everyone, please welcome Dr. Prasad. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, Alex, and thank you for the organizers for having me here, and thank you all for attending. Uh, I'm going to talk about COVID in the Academy, what have we learned, and uh, first, by way of background, you know, so just so you know a little bit about me. I'm a professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at UCSF, and I'm also a hematology oncology doctor, and so you'll find me every week at San Francisco General Hospital where I have a clinical practice. I work there every week, and I attend maybe two, three months a year on service. I teach several classes at the university. I teach a class in epidemiology called Publishing and Presenting Research, classes on randomized control trials, and some of the small groups for the medical students. I'm um, also a researcher. We run a laboratory, and that's where you can find some of the work we've done. So I think that should give you some context. Prior to the pandemic, we mostly do work in healthcare policy, in how we understand the effectiveness of medical therapies and the cost of cancer drugs, my interest in cancer medicine. And then the pandemic naturally caught my interest because it was a unprecedented event in healthcare policy and in epidemiology. The major theme of this talk, I think, is that the Academy was not able to handle the pandemic and the debates around the pandemic, and that the Academy, I think, failed in its fundamental duties to promote academic freedom. I think, to me, one of the most notable things is we've talked about several examples where the speakers have made their points on school closure, on masking outdoors, and some of the controversial policy decisions. They have their opinion. There are other people who may have different opinions. I tend to agree with most of the speakers of the morning. But no matter what your opinion, surely we have to have some concern that we did not host any debates in academic settings. This university, to my knowledge, did not host debates on all of the most pressing questions like school closure, lockdown, vaccine mandates, and some of the other things I'm going to talk about in my talk. I think we have to be concerned with the fact that we held zero debates at Harvard, at MIT, at Stanford, at my university on these controversial topics. I think we did permit inappropriate censoring of faculty, which I'll talk about. And I think there are two types of violations of academic freedom. There are active violations of freedom, where people were literally asked to stop talking. And there's active censorship, but there's also passive academic freedom violations, where people and debates were not fostered or permitted. All right, so here are some of the bigger issues that I'm going to touch on lightly in this talk. I think this is mostly a talk about the academy, but I think to understand the academy, you have to think about the issues. One is hospital vis visitor policies. During the pandemic, we had extremely draconian restrictions on visitors that I'm going to tell you about. What was the evidence to support those policies? How were those policies debated and implemented? There's the issue of delaying vaccine approval. I put that in my bonus content. If we run out, if we run out of things to talk about, I'll talk about that. Vaccine mandates and what are the rules around mandating medical interventions and firing people from jobs who refuse to comply with mandates? We'll talk about that. The idea that we'll have a perpetual booster, that each year we're going to get a booster after booster, whether you're 12 years old or 82 years old, which is a very American idea. Most of Europe has restricted annual boosters for COVID-19 to the elderly. Masking kids versus masking adults. I think we'll talk about whether or not we all should be testing ourselves for COVID-19 every time we have a scratch in our throat. Errors made by the CDC, long COVID, lockdown, school closure. I think these are the very controversial issues, and they have different policy interpretations. But let me give you a little flavor of the threats to freedom that we faced. I think perhaps one of the biggest threats to freedom occurred very early in the pandemic in 2020, and it was this. This is an article I wrote in STAT. It says, at a time when the U.S. needed a COVID-19 dialogue between scientists, Francis Collins moved to shut it down. We now know from FOIA emails that Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci were extremely critical of a petition that came out in the fall of 2020 called the Great Barrington Declaration. And full disclosure, I actually didn't sign the Great Barrington Declaration, although I have an affection for the authors of that, and I thought that they are well-intentioned in, well and they had a lot of things right, but I'm not a signatory of it. I'm also not a signatory of the counter memo either. But I certainly thought that that memo warranted discussion. So let me just tell you what was the premise of the memo. In the fall of 2020, after lockdowns were continuing uh, across many states and they were going to be, they were on and off again, schools were widely closed, elementary schools, middle schools, um, high schools, except private schools and daycares, those were open, but of course elementary schools and public schools were closed, typically in urban cities. The Great Barrington Declaration came out. It was a memo that basically said, we disagree with the ongoing pandemic response. We would favor a policy proposal where we focus on the people at extremely high risk of bad outcomes, the elderly, and have extreme precautions around those people. 
but let most of people in society return mostly to normal life. And I didn't agree completely with the spirit of that, but in that was something very different than the standard practice at that time, which was they supported widespread elementary school reopening in the fall of 2020. They supported middle school reopening. And that I wholeheartedly agree with. I thought that was the right policy decision in 2020. But Francis Collins, who is the head of the NIH at the time, did not want to have that dialogue. And even if you don't agree with everything your opponent says, why wouldn't you want to at least hear them out and maybe agree partially? School closure, elementary school closure, I thought that was something we could have all agreed upon in 2020. Instead, unfortunately, in the city of San Francisco and LA and DC and um, it tends to be large urban cities that run left of center. They kept schools closed for another year with catastrophic learning losses that we're seeing now. Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci are both high-ranking members of the NIH, and they were public spokespersons for the government policy. And that's kind of a tension, because if you're any researcher at any university in this country, you require funding predominantly from the National Institutes of Health or NIAID, which Fauci ran. There's a tension between being critical of the leader of NIAID while simultaneously submitting an R01 grant application to NIAID. And I think that's a fundamental tension where the policy spokesperson should be someone different than the person who's approving your funding, or naturally there'll be a reluctance among anyone seeking funding to be critical of the policy spokesperson, even when they're wrong. So that to me is a deep concern. So I think this was a this was in the FOIA emails. You can read the article and you can read what he said. He said, we call for a, quote, swift and devastating takedown of the GBD. He didn't want to engage with the authors. He didn't want to have any debate on the topic. He just wanted this gone. And they used sort of a coordinated media campaign to achieve that goal. Meanwhile, 16,000 scientists did sign this, suggesting that there was some dialogue that needed to be had. Facebook, a worthy judge of medical information, you know? <laughs> Should we really have Facebook referee scientific debates? I think it's extremely problematic, and throughout the pandemic, Facebook outsourced their independent fact-checking to some independent third-party groups to decide what kind of claims you could be making on Facebook, what could be removed. Most notably, Facebook prevented people for at least six months of even discussing the possibility that lab leak could be the source of the virus. They didn't, they, 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 they precluded the discussion of the possibility. And then they ultimately rescinded that based on some good reporting by Nick Wade and others that suggested that it's at least a possibility. And at this point, I think, with emerging evidence, it's perhaps even the most likely possibility. But to prevent the discussion on such an important policy issue, that I think is extremely problematic. A very recent study comes out by Harvard, which shows that the fact checkers overwhelmingly have one political set of views. They're overwhelmingly left of center. And that creates a problem when policy and scientific views and politics collide and then there's a strong overlap between the two. So we published this paper, it was called Characteristics of Facebook's Third-Party Medical Fact Checkers. And what we did was, we went through all of these, uh, one website that Facebook outsourced the fact checking to, and they list the experts that are doing the fact checking. And here's what we noticed that was very interesting. They had been fact checking health claims before COVID and after COVID. Before COVID-19, when you fact checked health claims, they mostly used scientists who had a very modest Twitter following. You know, only about, I don't know if this has a laser pointer on it or not, I don't think it does, okay. Only about, you know, 60% were even on Twitter. They had a modest Twitter follower, 6,000, or sorry, meeting followers were 1,000. Uh, they were reviewing a few articles. Um, you know, uh, they were really not on Twitter. After the pandemic began, the fact checkers were overwhelmingly on Twitter. They had an average of 42,000 followers, a median of 10,000 followers. What's my point here? How are the fact checkers being chosen? Is Facebook and, the, and this company really picking the best infectious disease doctors? Or are they picking the most visible doctors who have already signaled their perspective on policy issues and asking them to fact check things that they disagree with already? Which to me doesn't sound like independent fact checking. And in fact, we found at least one example where the fact checker had already been on Twitter and said, I hate this paper and has all these problems with it. And then they were asked to independently fact check that paper. That to me is an extremely problematic arrangement where the editors of the fact checking website essentially control what the facts are by selectively picking vocal people whose views they know to downplay and delegitimize ideas that they don't like. So I think that's a problematic example. 
Americans no longer say science has a positive effect on society. I think a lot of these pandemic things have led to a silent discord. You know, we have uptake of childhood immunization is, is reaching rock bottom levels. There's distrust in authority. There's distrust um, in the American public of science itself. This is a legacy of, I think, not having enough debates and trying to suppress debates, even when the people who were on the heterodox side of issues were often correct. <clears throat> this was an extremely interesting article that I read by Jay Bhattacharya about Cornell's new dean, Bob Harrington. Of course, Dr. Harrington has been promoted. He used to be the chairman of medicine at Stanford. He's now the dean at Cornell. And he specifically asked Jay Bhattacharya and Naran Ben David to stop talking to the press about COVID-19 policy, per Dr. Bhattacharya's account. So I'm going to read you the quote, but we have to put this in perspective. In 2020, Jay Bhattacharya was very early, and he's a faculty member here at Stanford. Uh, he's a physician economist. He had come out early on with a series of op-eds where he was critical of the idea of using lockdowns as a policy solution to the COVID-19 pandemic. I think it's pretty clear what his view was. Iran, of course, is a junior faculty infectious disease doctor who I suspect shared a lot of similar views to Jay and was doing some work on that. They initially went on TV that they'd done an early study in Santa Clara County about how lethal the virus is, and they went on TV to kind of promote their study and their point of view, where they felt that the virus was probably less lethal than the WHO estimate, which we had talked about, which was 3.4%, which is a case fatality rate, which is an inflated estimate, and the real IFR or infection fatality rate is going to be a lot lower, and that's their general point of view. Well, here's what happened to them. Oh, I can't quite read it from, okay. Harrington emailed me, this is Jay Bhattacharya verbatim, Harrington emailed me and Ben David, demanding that we stop giving public interviews and stop talking with the press. This order was entirely inconsistent with Stanford's nominal commitment to free speech rights of professors. Harrington, the chair of the department, later apologized to me for overstepping boundaries with this order, though he has yet to apologize to Ben David. He told me privately that his order came from someone above him in the university as chair of medicine that narrows it to the very highest officers at Stanford. I think it's extremely problematic. And in one case, I think it actually worked because Iran, after this incident, never gave a further public appearance on the topic. He was a junior faculty member, up for associate professor. He stopped talking, which I think is the natural, logical incentive he faced. Jay, of course, is a full professor, tenured. He was, had the position to continue to talk. But to me, to have the chair tell you you can't talk about your science to the news media is a huge infringement on academic freedom. All right, now we're going to get into some of the issues, and I'll try to talk about what I think some of the challenges are when it comes to the academy. You know, in the pandemic, I think I and many other doctors were extremely troubled by visitor restriction policies. The pandemic came, the administrators of the hospitals got very afraid, and we dramatically restricted who could come and see the patients in the hospital. There are many accounts of people losing their father or mother, and they can only talk to their father or mother through an iPad as the father or mother die. We performed a systematic review of all the literature to support these visitor policies. Is it the case that restricting these visitors actually slows the spread of infectious disease in the hospital? Does it slow the spread in communities? And here's the gist of what we found. We found very little evidence for that. But here's some of the points I want to make. One, what were these policies? Some of the policies make very little sense if you really think about them. One, for children who are hospitalized in pediatric hematology oncology units with leukemia, the policy prevented both parents from spending time with that dying child at the same time. They had to take turns. But what's the logic? They're going to go home and, you know, frat, and they're going to go home and be in the same space. But they couldn't both simultaneously be in the room. They were limited. So we had many, many examples where a parent was sleeping in the car and taking turns with the other parent. We prevented siblings from visiting dying siblings. If it's a child, we had a, many hospitals had a blanket prevention of any other child from visiting a dying 10-year-old boy the 8-year-old brother can't visit, for instance. We prevented children from holding the hand of their dying father and mother. And ultimately, I find it no credible evidence that these policies slowed the spread in the hospital or in the community, even in early 2020. There's just no credible evidence that these policies had any benefit on the stated outcome. I think what we don't talk about is that, to some degree, this is a human rights violation, in my opinion. This is a moral problem. This is a problem of the human spirit, to ban someone from seeing their dying brother. And the threshold to do that, what should be the evidence you would require to, to have such a ban? The nurses who had to enforce this, many of them have told me that it caused a lot of moral injury to the doctors to enforce a policy that you don't believe in, that's so cruel to a family. 
personal protective equipment shortage was a stated reason for these policies. But to me, what troubles me most is there was no accommodation made for any modified strategy. So for instance, what if a family would say, look, we understand the risk of COVID-19. Here's what we're willing to do. We'll quarantine in a hotel for two weeks before we come here. If everyone's without a fever, we'll come and visit for unlimited time. And on the way out, we'll quarantine for another two weeks. Not only did we not allow people for negotiating these kinds of things, we did no studies of the topic. What if a family were to say, listen, I know there's a PPE shortage. I'm willing to come here with some modified PPE. We'll use a tablecloth instead of a gown, or we'll use a cloth mask. Or at least let's test that hypothesis and see if we can get away with more liberal. No testing was ever done. So to me, it's problematic from a moral standpoint. It's problematic from a medical standpoint. And the crux of the issue is that evidence was not generated. There was no attempt at a federal level, at a local level, to try to reduce this burden on families. No university or hospital, to my knowledge, has ever held a debate on these visitor policies. UCSF implemented the policy. We never had a debate among the faculty to say who supports this policy, who wants to argue for an alternative policy, what's the evidence. And these policies continued post-vaccination. So this to me is an extremely problematic example. Passive academic freedom is that, not having debates on lockdown, school closure, masking, vaccine policies, visitor policies. That to me is the definition of a passive infringement on freedom. I think, we, I think this to me is the greatest threat that right now the list of topics that are the third rail in medicine is growing by the day, and you cannot even have a debate on those topics. This fall, my university has, and, mo and in fact, we have a paper coming out on this, about 20% of, of hospitals nationally, re-implemented a mask mandate for visitors in the gift shops and lobbies if they're coming in, you know, but 80% did not. What do you think predicts that? Do you think it's predicted by the number of COVID-19 cases or hospitalizations or deaths in that area? No, it's predicted by the percent of the county vote for Biden or Trump. That's the biggest predictor, of course, for the hospital masking policy. But to me, what strikes me as odd is that no, no university is having the debate. Johns Hopkins implements it, but they're not allowing the faculty to have a pro-con debate. Should we have a yearly masking policy, knowing that the evidence is sparse and knowing that people may feel different and knowing that 80% of hospitals are not doing it? Okay, let's talk about vaccine mandates for a second. I think this is always a very contentious issue, and Kevin has done some great work here that I'm gonna show in a second. But when you mandate a personal health intervention, be it a pill or a vaccine product, you know, could I go around and find people with high blood pressure and mandate that they swallow blood pressure reducing medicine? I could tell myself that the evidence that blood pressure reducing medicine will improve their life is so good. But in medicine, generally, we think that mandates are only ethically permissible if not if there's a benefit to the individual who's getting the product, but there has to be sufficient benefit to third-party individuals such, as, such that the loss of autonomy to the individual is justified. So it's not enough to tell me, like, your blood pressure is high, therefore you should take the blood pressure pill. You have to prove that by me doing that, I actually benefit a third party so much that my autonomy is worth being infringed upon. Okay, so the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's talk about what the vaccine mandate policies. They were implemented mostly by the Biden administration, mostly in the fall of 2021. The vaccine mandate policies, and people were fired because they didn't comply with the policy. Here's what I think is noteworthy. Number one, we didn't collect the evidence. So in the randomized control trials testing the vaccines, we measured whether or not people who are randomized to vaccine or the saltwater injection had, um, actually the saltwater, had the placebo injection, had we, ran, we, we tested whether or not they got COVID-19, symptomatic COVID-19. But if you wanted to ask the question whether or not transmission is slowed, it would have been very simple to build that into the study. You could have had anybody, they could pick a thousand people in both arms and have all of their family members swab their nose once a week, you know, at set intervals, and ask, is there a reduction in COVID-19 spread in, in households where one person was vaccinated? That could have been required by USFDA. They chose not to require that. And because they didn't require that, they actually have never generated the evidence that by vaccinating one person, you're preventing some you know, asymptomatic carriage and spread. They never had that evidence. That's one piece of data. Two, in the, in the summer of 2020, there was an event in Provincetown, Massachusetts, where uh, I think something like 1,000 men came down with COVID-19, and almost all of them had been vaccinated. And that was an early harbinger of the fact that being vaccinated will not prevent you from acquiring COVID-19 and prevent you from transmitting. Then, of course, by the time the fall mandate was implemented, I think it was well known that vaccinated people could transmit the virus, just like somebody who was unvaccinated. So I ask, 
what was the ethical justification to mandate a vaccine that could not have a benefit to third parties because they can spread the virus anyway? And I think the right, right with infinite rolls of the dice, all outcomes inevitable. What that means is that with even if there's a dampening of transmission, if you keep living in the world, you're going to get the COVID-19 eventually. And at this point, that's the reality. I think everybody, nearly everybody who's been vaccinated or not vaccinated has had and recovered from COVID-19. Some people think they haven't, but, you know, check your antibody. Okay, you know, you might have. You just don't know it. This policy is extremely problematic. Doctors, nurses, and staff who had gotten COVID-19 while working in March and April of 2020, while working, you know, back when, before there was a vaccine, if they decided that they didn't want to comply with the mandate, they were fired from their job, including professors in the University of California system, like Aaron at UC Irvine. I think that's extremely problematic because there is, um, sorry, let's just say there's no good data that vaccines benefit somebody who already recovered from COVID-19, who had natural immunity. The decision to mandate the vaccine, even in people who had recovered from prior infection, was revealed in an interview with Paul Offit to be made by the administration in a private vote of five scientists, of which Paul Offit was one of the two who voted against that. He said that you should get credit for having had and recovered from COVID-19. You don't need as many doses of the vaccine. That was his point of view. To me, it's not clear that you need any doses of the vaccine if you have had and recovered from COVID-19. Okay, and kids, like particularly college kids, were pushed out of school. What's my point here? You may agree with my interpretation of the mandate or you may disagree. But one thing that's quite notable is, again, no university had any debates on the COVID-19 vaccine requirements for the undergraduates on this campus, for the undergraduates at Harvard, the undergraduates at Brandeis. No faculty were allowed. We didn't have debates on this topic. I think this was an extremely worthwhile topic to debate. So what does that say about the state of the academy when we're implementing a policy and we're firing nurses and our clinics are understaffed, which they were because we're firing nurses, and we're not even talking about whether or not the policy makes sense? And this is the paper that Kevin did. And I think this to me is, in fact, it might even be the single most downloaded paper in this journal or something like that. It's like the highest altmetric factor because there's a huge amount of the public who probably shares Kevin's intuition that it doesn't seem to make much sense to force a 20-year-old man who had hadn't recovered from COVID-19 to be boosted for the virus he just hadn't recovered from. It doesn't make a lot of sense intuitively. And Kevin shows in this paper, COVID-19 vaccine boosters for young adults, a risk benefit assessment and ethical analysis of mandate policies, he shows clearly that this is actually a net harm. Shown in this figure, under you know, most, uh, most, I think, reasonable assumptions, even, if anything, conservative assumptions about the vaccine, let me walk you through the gist of the figure. I don't have a laser pointer, but the gist is, it is possible that giving somebody an additional COVID-19 dose, a young adolescent man, will slightly lower the risk of being hospitalized with COVID-19 in the future, and that's shown in the, in the blue and the, and the green bars. But what is certain is that giving an adolescent man, particularly between the ages of 16 and 26, a COVID-19 shot has a real risk of being hospitalized from having heart inflammation or myocarditis. That's about one in 10,000. And he's showing it here under different assumptions, the risk of myo and pericarditis and the red bars. And I think under most of the most plausible assumptions, if you mandate this group of kids to get COVID-19 booster after booster, you're going to hurt them over time. It's not a net benefit, it's a net harm to that group. So there's a mandate in place that's actually harming a group of people with no benefit to third parties. I mean, the ethics of it are extremely problematic. And this was supported by most universities. Most universities supported this, and there were no debates on the topic, and anyone who said otherwise had some professional repercussions we're going to talk about. This was a paper that a student who was concerned about these policies wrote to me, and we did this analysis. It's called COVID-19 Vaccine-Induced Myocarditis in Young Men, a Systematic Review. And the gist of it is shown in this figure, which is that many people like to say that the risk of having myocarditis was worse from the virus than it was from the vaccine. It's still better to get the vaccine because it's worse from the virus. They said that because they were looking at the population risk of having heart inflammation, which is shown in the purple bars. That if you look at everyone who got the vaccine, from 80-year-old 80 80 year old grandmothers to 20-year-old men, the risk of myocarditis is actually quite low. You know, 80-year-old grandmothers who get the vaccine don't have that much myocarditis. But imagine if you just look at men, or just Pfizer, or just people between the ages of 12 and 17, shown in the green, that's one stratifier. Then let's say you look at just men in Moderna, two stratifiers. Let's say you look at three stratifiers, men, dose two, 18 to 24, or men, Pfizer, 16 to 29. And then let's say you look at all four stratifiers, Pfizer, Moderna, men, 12 to 17, dose one, dose two, you know, et cetera. And what you see is that 
You can make a risk look low if the denominator includes everybody, but we know this is not a problem that everyone faces equally. It's a problem predominantly faced by young men, dose two, Moderna, and Pfizer, you know? So you can lie with statistics and say the virus is worse than et cetera, et cetera, by not focusing on, well, what about for a 20-year-old man? Well, then, of course, it's clear the vaccine is worse and dose two is worse, and maybe they need one dose, maybe they need no doses, maybe we need to do randomized trials of lower doses, None, we had none of these debates. I mean, I, I'm not even sure I, like some people say no dose is all, some people say lower dose. We can debate that. But to me, it's fascinating that university did not engage in this topic, no debates on the topic. All right, one more example, and then maybe I'll talk more about uh, the risk to the academy masking. I think the United States did something that was a truly a departure from most of the Western world, which is that we went beyond Europe and the European CDC and our CDC and our American Academy of Pediatrics, they recommended that two-year-old children who are in daycare wear cloth masks up to 10 hours a day, except for when they nap side by side next to each other for two hours in the same unventilated room. So that's the time that they don't have to do it. Okay, to me, that's an extremely problematic policy recommendation that was endorsed by this administration, that was mandated by Head Start. One, I think plausibly it doesn't make much sense that wearing a cloth mask, which is ineffective, could prevent the spread of a virus among two-year-olds who are not wearing it that well when they take it off for two hours to all nap next to each other in the same room. That, to me, strikes me as e you don't need much education to know that's not going to work so well. And yet, this policy was not discussed. There were no, there, it was very difficult to get criticism of this policy. As Tracy and I know, we've published several papers on this. I'll show you. And the administration that was setting the policy was not, has never conducted any appropriate studies on the policy. In fact, the CDC director testified in front of Congress saying it would have been unethical to conduct a study of this policy because I'm so certain that it works. I don't have equipoise, that's her position. The American Academy of Pediatrics put this very provocative um, statement out on Twitter. They say, you think babies and young adults study faces so you may worry that having mass caregivers would harm their language development and their speech. The, there are no studies to support this concern. Young children use other clues, and so being adults all day wearing masks doesn't delay their development. Well, the reason that there would be no studies to support that concern is that no society in the history of the world has ever done something so stupid. I mean, no one has ever, so how would you study it if no one has ever done such a stupid thing? So you would never have anyone to study it in. I think that's kind of crazy to say. Masks were required here in Palo Alto, full of smart people. But on COVID-19 policy, they got a lot wrong. Masks were required outdoors in K-8. to And actually, it was a cloth mask, which is pretty, actually proven in randomized studies to be useless. OK, I mean, I don't think any, even the people who, who believe in masking don't believe cloth masks works. They admit that they don't work at all. And it was required outdoors. Which is, and of course, people, nobody gets the virus outdoors. It's transmitted indoors. And all right, we get the picture. OK. Um, I don't know if I want to go on and on about this. Maybe I'll skip over a little bit of that. I think some of the most prominent experts elevated by the media, this is uh, Zainab Tufeki, says, the topic of children's transmission is very unsettled, but I think kids K through 12 can mask up. They do in many countries. And OK if younger ones do it imperfectly. And this was really sort of the New York Times the New York Times position. Um, you know, we call this the noble lies of COVID-19, where we were recommended to do something that I think has very low quality evidence. Um, and this was in a very good article about we need better evidence on non-drug interventions. I wrote this article called Climbing the Pandemic Failures Chart Research on Masking Kids. Um, I'm gonna skip that, I'm just gonna go to my takeaway point. I wrote this article in 2021 at The Atlantic Magazine. It was called The Downsides of Masking Young Students Are Real because adult vaccination had been made available to any adult who chooses in the United States, and yet we still continued to mask two-year-olds in daycare. And so my article in The Atlantic was extremely critical of that. And I think the backlash that received was notable. I mean, there may have been hundreds, perhaps thousands of emails to the chancellor of my university that I'd be fired for having written this op-ed. And I received uh, hundreds of nasty emails. And many of my colleagues um, you know, professionally attacked me online. Uh, I, think, uh, I think I was right when I wrote it. I think I'm right now. But to me, what was so fascinating was you know, the university could have had a debate on that. Like, it was clear that it had captured the zeitgeist. People cared about this issue. 
But again, Harvard, Stanford, Yale, nobody had a debate on this topic. I think Tracy talks about good, non-randomized evidence. This is basically a study that comes out of Spain, and I, I would put this in this bucket. It's a good study. Here's what you see here. The, the line basically shows you, let's look at that blue line, shows you like the risk a child will spread COVID-19. And what you need to know is that if you were six and up, you wore the mask, and if you were five and down, you didn't. And what you see is that actually, if the mask did anything, there would be like a step down or the slope would change, right? It's from five to six, but nothing changes from five to six, suggesting that like masking kids doesn't do anything, which I think is the answer actually doesn't do anything. It doesn't slow the spread of COVID-19. Probably because, you know, they're not doing it all the time and, you know, masks are imperfect and they don't wear it right. And, you know, in my hospital, you have to wear a mask even today unless you hold a cup of coffee. If you have a cup of coffee, you don't need to have them. You can take your mask. You just have to hold it. You don't even have to drink it. So that's the policy we have. When the CDC director testified in Congress that she couldn't have studied the issue because she knew it worked. She didn't have equipoise. Tracy and I wrote this article called Does Equipoise Exist for Masking Kids? If anything, we're of the point of view that you couldn't study it because it was so laughably implausible that it would work. But the mere fact that there are people like I and Tracy who exist and the CDC director exist proves that there was equipoise, that the community of scientific experts had disagreement on the issue, ergo it would be ethical to conduct the study to settle the question. And then most concerningly is that the United States decision to mask children as young as two has been extended into 2023. The policy continued year after year after year and was enforced in places like Head Start, federally funded programs. Okay, last bit. Errors made by the CDC. I think we talk so much about misinformation and disinformation. I think, sadly, these are terms that are weaponized by people who hold the orthodox view to extinguish any idea that they don't like. But I think it's refreshing to look at some of the orthodox views that they were completely wrong about. CDC director, this is from Reuters, this is from May of, sorry, April of 2020, April 27, 2021. The US CDC has not seen a link between heart inflammation and COVID-19 vaccines. This came out after the Israelis had reported the link, after the Europeans had reported the link, after I think even the CDC have internal emails leaked suggesting that they were aware of a link, and yet the CDC director is lying to the American public about a real risk to a particular group, young men, um, from the product. Here's another example. Jay Bhattacharya writes, just wondering, did the fact checkers ever correct Tony Fauci, Rochelle Walensky, or Rachel Maddow for saying that the COVID vax prevents you from getting and spreading COVID? If not, why not? It was one of the biggest lies of the COVID-19 era. And of course, on Fortune, it's official. Vaccinated people don't transmit COVID-19, April 1st, 2021. You know, these are extremely problematic errors made by the establishment. We have this preprint that hopefully will someday come out. We're working on the revision still. It's called Statistical and Numerical Errors Made by the CDC During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And it was led by uh, Kelly Cronert, who's, an in, who's sort of an independent computer scientist who kept track of CDC. Here's what we find. We have a big table of the errors they made. I'll just give you a couple flavors of what they're saying that are wrong. Okay. They say COVID-19 is a top five cause of death in children of all age groups. That's what the CDC said. Okay, quote, the preprint had inaccurate data. The CDC chose the most extreme version of the flawed data. Specifically for COVID-19, they used cumulative counts, which actually spanned more than two years, and death was attributed if it was one of any causes of death. Whereas for the other causes of death, they only used one year as a denominator, and death was attributed only if it was the underlying, single underlying cause of death. So it's literally comparing apples and oranges, and like, you know, like a high school student would know that this is a bad comparison. And that's what their CDC is putting out. Another one. COVID-19 hospitalizations for children and teens are increasing again in the US. And actually, their own data showed from their own website, if you check that statistic, that the hospitalization had peaked two weeks before and was decreasing. So, you know, we have just this table of these, and these errors are laughable errors, but they almost always frame the pandemic in more scary terms so that they could support their preconceived policy notions. Okay, let's talk about threats to the academy. So, you know, I was surprised this year my first threat to the academy was that, you know, COVID-19 is one of my interests, but some of my other interests are, you know, I'm very interested in like whether or not medical therapies have an expiration date. So for instance, like in the 1970s and 80s, we ran randomized studies of whether or not like older people should take a baby aspirin. And those studies tended to like show that they should take a baby aspirin. We repeated those studies in the last decade. And actually those studies tend to show that they shouldn't take a baby aspirin. What happened? Well, people now, we don't smoke as much, we're more obese, 
We take statin medication. We used to be thinner. We smoked more. You know, the difference is the population. So we wrote some papers about whether or not medical evidence for pharmaceutical drugs, this has nothing to do with COVID, should have an expiration date, that at some point maybe society changes in some ways that we should reassess evidence. And so I was asked by the American College of Clinical Pharmacists to give the keynote lecture in Dallas on that topic. Do pharmaceutical drug products need a medical expiration date? But my talk was interestingly canceled. So why my talk was canceled at a medical conference? Because maybe about 100 people on Twitter tweeted at the conference organizers that they disagreed with my COVID-19 policy views and I shouldn't be allowed to give a talk on whether or not baby aspirin should be reassessed for cardiovascular prevention. Okay, so to me, this is a type of, this is a real threat, is that, you know, what's the statute of limitations for disagreeing with me on one issue to prevent me from talking about any other issue? I suspect it's gonna fade in the next year or two, people will forget, but it is a disincentive for a researcher to comment about anything if they think that their talk on a completely unrelated issue can be targeted and, can and canceled. I'll also add one thing. A hundred people tweet at the account to cancel my lecture. I think that's, I counted about a hundred, 200 people. Maybe 20 of them are actually members of the organization. Maybe 40 of them are people who, they got a grief with me. You know, they have a slight with me from something else. Like I was critical of their cancer paper or I didn't like their cardiovascular paper. We have like a different longstanding academic disagreement. Okay, and then maybe like 20 people are just like bots and they don't, you know, they're not even like active characters in this game. And so who are these organizers who just you know, capitulate to a little bit of noise? If the organizer had any courage, they just send a message saying, look, I get it, some of you may not like his views on that. He's not talking about that, he's talking about this. You don't wanna come, you don't have to come. If you do wanna come, we can talk about this issue. It's not so hard to stand up and just say, enough is enough. We can't just cancel everybody for any issue that you may disagree with. Preprint censorship, oh, you have the great talk on preprints, okay. Well, what's interesting is, <laughs> I just tell you just my perspective on preprints, this is a paper that I, this is an article I wrote called Preprint Servers Have Repeatedly Censored Our Work on COVID-19 Policy. So I wanna be very clear. What is the role of a preprint server? Uh, it, there's no peer review on the way in. If I don't have spelling errors and I, you know, and it's basically like, it looks like it's not fraudulent and like I did a good faith job to explain what I did, uh, you know, they have some obligation to just post that and let the marketplace of ideas decide what to do with it. And yet many preprints were pulled from these servers. Let me give you some examples. Mask mandates and COVID-19, a reanalysis of the Boston School Mask Study, led by Tracy. And that was pulled off SSRN, which is run by Elsevier Saunders, the Lancet family of journals. And it says, quote, given the need to be cautious about posting medical content, SSRN is selective about papers we post. So you can't post my preprint. Interesting. A compre, oh, so then this is a fun one. Uh, I'll come to that again. Let's go to the third one. Falsification endpoints and pitfalls of using observational studies and reviews of effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines, a critique of the evidence. And am I right, Tracy? This paper was just published last week. It just was published in Peer Review Journal. It was pulled in April from SSRN because, quote, given the need to be cautious about COVID-19 content. Okay, so I've got, we've gotten it through a Peer Review Journal. It's been published, but SSRN refused to post it on their website. Interpretation of wide confidence intervals. Here, I won't bore you with it, but basically, the Cochrane analysis, they did a review of all the randomized studies of masking, and they basically said that, you know, masks don't work. But the confidence interval is very big, meaning that maybe they work a little bit, or maybe they don't work, but they're harmful a little bit. You know, it's a wide confidence interval. And then many people said, like, well, you can't say done work. You're supposed to say, like, you know, it's possibly it works, but possibly it doesn't. You have to talk about the confidence interval. So we were like, okay, well, does Cochrane do that consistently? We pulled all the 22 studies in Cochrane where the conference interval was wide, and everyone said, done work, done work, done work, done work, done work. And now, well, of course, maybe it works a little bit. The conference interval is wide. You know, it's a very selective. So we wrote that interpretation of wide conference intervals. Like, are they being consistent? And we put that on the set, and they, they pulled that too. And then finally, the second one. We did an analysis of all the articles that my lab submitted to preprint servers. We call that a comprehensive analysis of articles submitted to preprint servers from one laboratory, download statistics, rates of rejection, and reasons for rejection, and we submitted that to the preprint server, and they won't post that either. <laughs> they, won't, they won't even touch it. They won't even let you know that they're not posting my articles. And the same was true for MedRxIV. They wouldn't post their own analysis that they weren't posting my articles either. So to me, this is very problematic, okay, that like, this is not their purview. You, you can't, and, and then you may say, well, okay, your art, you know, you, you know you, maybe your papers aren't perfect. I'm not, of course, no one's papers are perfect. But I can definitely find some preprints that are worse than mine on the server, okay? I am guarantee you I can find some worse ones than my papers. Um, 
And, why, and how are they choosing what to post? They're choosing things that support the establishment view and they're not allowing a dialogue on the server. And that to me is a big problem. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about Wikipedia. I think, I think it's, a, it's really gotten to be a problem. Like if you read John Yonidi's Wikipedia profile, it says like something like this. Maybe like pre-pandemic is what it said. John Yonidi's is like the most science, one of the most cited scientists of all times with like a Hirsch index of 150 with more citations per year than like anyone. And John is like a great thinker who like discovered the reproducibility crisis and framed it. His paper, Why Most Published Research Findings is False, has been the most downloaded paper. And uh, you know, he's from Greece and blah, blah, blah. Now if you read his profile, it's like, John Yonidi's uh, was once a very uh, prominent thinker. <laughs> In the pandemic, he said that uh, no one was going to die, and that if anyone dies of COVID nineteen, that's uh, like not true, and and like it's just full of distortions, and it's like extremely critical of him. Well, who writes these things? You know, Jay Bhattacharya is terrible. The Great Barrington Declaration is terrible. Who writes these? Are like a group of people who are extremely biased, and like I looked at my own, and I feel like it mischaracterizes my positions on some of these issues where I was actually supportive of randomized studies. I didn't say don't do it, I didn't say do it. I said do it, but also do a study. That was my position, it mischaracterizes my position. And if you dig into who's running it, I find this Alex BRN, he's running my whole Twitter, he's got the, he's got the whole Wikipedia page hijacked. And who is he? So it's how Wikipedia defames and delig delegitimizes anybody raising concerns against the WHO narrative on COVID. And this Norman Fenton has a whole post on that this guy does it to like all these, all the people who are talking about this. So that to me is another problem, that you don't get balance even in this like online encyclopedia. Okay, there's another interesting thing about the pandemic to me. Scientists were attacked. So Nature Magazine has a real article, it's a, I mean, it's, and it's, I agree with Nature on this, quote, I hope you die how the COVID pandemic unleashed attacks on scientists. And there are many scientists who supported masking, supported lockdowns, supported school closure, who received death threats that they should die. You know, some of these public health commissioners received death threats. That's like absolutely inappropriate. You know, that's like, you know, even I disagreed with them on some of the policy, but I don't hope they die. I hope they have a debate, you know, instead and maybe change their views. Um, they got a lot of criticism. And nature covers the fact that they got attacks like this and these attacks are inappropriate. But nature's coverage of scientists being attacked does not include a single account of somebody who's attacked for holding the opposite view. It's, you can only, it's only bad if you are attacked for holding the canonical establishment view, but Jay was attacked and John Yonides was attacked and Scott Atlas was attacked and they don't, there's, no, there's no science nature piece about how the, it's wrong to attack them too. And in fact, the academy supports attacking them. The faculty senate here condemned COVID-19 actions of Hoover's Scott Atlas. If you actually go back and look at Scott Atlas's positions, his positions were, Schools should reopen in 2020. Kids probably don't need to wear masks. Masks probably don't work that well. We should develop the vaccine. I mean, I think Scott Atlas's position, lockdowns probably aren't that effective and have counterlateral harms. I think Scott Atlas's positions are like not that unreasonable. They're probably mostly been vindicated. And he was condemned by the faculty senate, which I think is sort of the opposite of what should have happened, which is maybe we should have a fireside chat with Scott Atlas to see what he has to say. And I think largely he was condemned because if you stood next to Donald Trump, it would be easy to be seen as his proxy and be demonized. Okay, we talked about Facebook. Facebook finally lifted the ban on posts claiming that COVID-19 was man-made. Okay, I'm gonna give one last fun example, then I'm gonna stop. I saw this paper, a really interesting paper that appeared in JAMA Network Open. It was called Communication of COVID-19 Misinformation on Social Media by Physicians in the U.S., and I thought to myself, my God, what are these bad physicians doing? They're having misinformation. And in the paper, they go through all the doctors who have said misinformation on social media. And I looked at the specialty, addiction, medicine, allopathic medicine, cardiac, electrophysiology, hematology, oncology, one doctor. What? I was like, one doc? I was like, who is this rogue hemonc doctor talking about COVID-19? And luckily, the table had the quote. The quote said, quote, if we drop mask mandates too soon, the pandemic will take the exact same trajectory as it otherwise would. And I thought to myself, who said that? I said, I said, I said that, that's my tweet. If we drop them too soon, it will take the same trajectory, meaning that the mandate does not have much effect, right? That's the, that, that's, I think that would be the English language interpretation. If we drop the mandates too soon, it will take the same trajectory, meaning that the mandate's not doing anything for the trajectory. 
Okay, the original article dated this 2-13-2021, but I actually tweeted this 2-13-2022. You mean to tell me that you still want the mandate in April 2022? I mean, it's been a few years, okay? My statement is true because when I made my statement, Fauci was said, quote, in the media, the nation's former top infectious disease expert said, quote, mask, mask initiatives may have a small impact at the community level. Even Fauci was agreeing with me by this time. He had rescinded his prior view. But I noticed something, that they, they got the date wrong. And I, I show you the right date here because they corrected the paper. Why did they correct the paper? I asked a student of mine to go through every quote in their table and ask, is it correct? So in the paper on doctors spreading misinformation, we went through every quote and we found actually the date is wrong, the quote is wrong, the paraphrase is wrong. It's just riddled with errors. And so I submitted to JAMA. I said, listen, your paper on misinformation is full of misinformation. They got all the dates wrong. And then JAMA issues a correction. Here it is. Errors in quotes and dates. In the original investigation, the errors included dates for nine of the quotes, which is incorrect in 2021 and 2022. Oh, uh, and then also, some quotes had minor wording inaccuracies, such as one thing about natural immunity. And this, the, the, look at that, the, the correction is like a mile long. Everything was wrong about that paper. All right, so I'm happy that they have issued some correction. All right, so I'm gonna stop now and we'll do a fireside chat, but I just end on one thing that doesn't fit the narrative, which was that I was fortunate that despite all my actions. I was promoted to full professor during the pandemic for, so, you know, just goes to show you that I think a lot of people in the academy who do actually agree with us on some of these issues and they've been, feel like they can't talk about it. So I'm happy to take questions and you can find more about my stuff on Substack and YouTube and uh, look forward to the conversation.